Welcome back to the Plan Your Federal Retirement podcast. I am Christian Sakamoto. And today we have a special episode. JT Farron has joined me as well. How are you doing, JT? Really good, Christian. Excited to be here. And welcome to Alaska. It's good to have you here. Thank you. Yes, yes. For those who are watching this podcast, uh, I am not in my usual office in Washington. I'm up in Alaska. It's really nice to be here. A little chilly, of course, but uh, it's always colder in Alaska. Um, Who would have known that? But today is a special episode because Micah and Tammy asked us to record this episode to answer some of the questions that were asked in the last live podcast that they did. As you guys know, you guys were submitting some really good questions and they were answering those in that live podcast. So today, there was lots of other questions that just weren't answered. Um, and so we wanted to go through and, and spend time to answering those questions. So if it's all right with you, JT, I'll just jump right in. Kim had wrote in and asked, within a few months of retirement, should I move my TSP funds into the G or the 2025 life cycle to protect what I have now? So really good question, Kim, when it comes to the TSP, main thing we're looking at with not only the TSP, but with our investments in general, is what does our investment rules say? We have uh, an investment rule that says any money that you plan to spend in the next five years, that we don't want it to sit in the stock market. We don't want it to be in the stock market. And we've mentioned this before. The reason why is if we look at what happened back in 2008, when the market was down for five years, you know, not a good time to be selling our investments when when the market is down, right? So that would say any money that we do plan to spend in five years, that it, it should be in the sidelines, not in the market. And we utilize a kind of a buckets approach to this we've talked about before. We've got a cash bucket and an income bucket. Both of these are set aside, not in the market. And then the rest of that money would be in growth. So if we go back to your question, Kim, and we say, hey, Should we move it into the G fund or should we move it into the life cycle fund? I'll just start with the life cycle fund. Life cycle funds are a blend of G, F, C, S, and I funds. Some of those are growth. Some of those are more safe, like the G fund and the F fund, right? So if we moved it into our life cycle fund and we're retired and we start drawing money, then because of the TSP having proportionate distribution rules then we're not able to separate those dollars that are coming out as distributions. We're not able to say, I only want to take distributions from a G fund, or I only want to take distributions from my C fund, right? And so because of that, the TSP, you know, it it might have a problem if we just parked it in the life cycle fund. Similarly with the G fund as well, I don't know your, and this would be dependent on the investments that you have, if there's anything else outside of the TSP, But uh, if we just put it in the G fund and now we don't have enough in growth with outside investments, that could be a problem too. So we just have to look at it when, whenever we're looking at the TSP is seeing which tool that, uh, that is going to be used for, for the right job. And it might not be that we use TSP exclusively in retirement in order to meet your goal because of those proportionate distribution rules. So something to be thinking about. A lot of times we're looking at IRAs, for example. Um, to where we can separate those dollars a little bit. Yeah, that's a great point, Christian. I think a couple of things to point out there that the TSP is just another tool in the toolbox. And one thing that I like to always ask is how does this fit into the broader context of your financial plan? And how does it help you achieve your investment goals? So kind of going on to that next question goes right along with this. A question from Nicholas that says, how much money do I need to retire comfortably? Well, again, you know, what are your investment goals? What are your retirement goals? This is a tough question because everyone's different, right? I know some mm-hmm. people that just retire on Social Security alone. They can live on $2,000 a month. Other clients, they need $20,000 a month. So it just depends on, on you individually. Great place to start is to look at your current cash flow. How much are you spending today? We can use that number of your current monthly expenditures as a retirement income goal. And then what we love to do with our clients is build out a retirement income timeline. We start with that goal and then we list out all their sources of income over the long term and see how 
those sources of income are going to change over time. Right? We have the TSP income from their TSP. We have income from Social Security. We have income from their first pension and maybe some others in some other cases, right? Um, but we can see where all those sources are, of income are coming from and if it adds up to their current cash flow needs. Mm. So I think that that's kind of a good place to start in answering that kind of difficult question. Yeah, it really is case by case. And we have to really understand, Nicholas, a little bit more on your personal situation. But I do think, JT, that's good advice. Um, now, the next question comes from Young, having to do with the the retirement, the FERS retirement amount. He asked, how do I calculate that yearly retirement amount? And so really, it's a formula that we look at and we would take your high three, the highest three years, the average of that highest three years of working with the federal government, multiplied by your years, months, and days of credible service, multiplied by your multiplier. And in some cases, the multiplier, in most cases, are is going to be 1%. There's cases where it can be 1.1%. There's cases where it can be even higher if we're maybe special provisions. So this number, this, this formula gets us that unreduced gross yearly pension amount. So then if we took that amount, we divided it by 12, then we know our monthly amount. But this is going to be gross and not net. So Young, we have to also look at what's the difference, gross versus net. Net is going to be what actually hits your bank account every month. And that's probably the number that we want to look at closely and look and pay attention to a little bit more. So then we take that gross, that unreduced gross pension, and we look at deductions that come from that. The first deduction that comes from your first pension would be the survivor benefits, whether we're choosing the full or the partial, if those survivor benefits are applicable to you. The next deduction would be federal taxes to look at. If we live in a state where there's state income taxes, that'll be another deduction. Then there's the other insurances that can come out. FEHB, the primary one. Then there's possibly life insurance, possibly long-term care, maybe dental, maybe vision, right? So you've got your gross pension, then you take out the survivor, the taxes, the insurances, then we get our, our net number. That's the number we need to really be looking at, but it's really based on that formula there, Young. So hopefully that helps. And that's great, Christian. I love the distinction between gross versus net. Because those deductions can really add up and reduce that that net number. Uh, next question we have coming in is from Martin. And he says, does the government pension take the form of an annuity that I have to purchase? Or is it automatic after the retirement process is complete? This is a great question because there's some vocabulary here that can be a little bit confusing. An annuity versus a pension. Christian, you know that we love the word pension when referring to your FERS annuity, we call it a pension, but there is an annuity that you can buy with your TSP. One of the options is that instead of taking income directly from your TSP, you know, there's a few options there we've talked about in prior episodes, but you can basically use your TSP lump sum to buy a MetLife annuity. And then MetLife would send you an income stream for the rest of your life. That annuity is different than your first annuity, which we call a pension. So drawing a distinction between the two is really important. Yeah, that's huge, especially because when we're looking at the TSP annuity, that is with MetLife, that we've mentioned this before, that's a irreversible decision when we end up going that annuity route. And, uh, you know, anytime we have an irreversible decision like that, that's some that's when we got to hit the pause button and really say, is this going to be the right move or not? Um, so just wanted to, to share that. But as far as your first pension goes, your first pension, that's going to be you know automatic, assuming that you've met the, the criteria and are vested in the first benefits. Next question comes from Charles. He says, I would like to work part-time when I retire. Would that affect my retirement? You know, good question, Charles. And I'm a fan of when clients are looking at retiring, if they wanted to go do something else to maybe look at a part-time job, I, I'm not opposed to that. I think that could be good for, for a lot of folks. So the things and how that can affect your retirement, we're going to be mainly on the um, taxes side. So just making sure we are not only making sure that our enough is going to be withheld when we go work part-time, 
but also just seeing, are we going to be jumping a tax bracket that we maybe didn't plan on being in retirement? And that could possibly be a surprise there. Um, I also say when it comes to working in, in retirement, even if it's part-time, is are we working because we couldn't make it work with our retirement cash flow, with our pension, with maybe Social Security, with, with our investments? Or are we working and getting extra money above our cash flow needs? And in that case, if we're, if we're working and we're getting more money than we're used to spending, I'd be very cautious to then say, okay, go ahead and spend all that money. We just have to be really mindful to save as much of that as we can. So we're not getting used to that lifestyle creep. That can happen to all of us. Um, you know, and, and I'm not picking on you specifically that that's just something that happens. The more money that we make above what we're normally used to spending, that a tendency to spend more could, could creep in there. And then other things to think about too would be, you know, if, if you are receiving the first supplement, if that applies to you, that could be affected with part-time income as well, because there's a earnings limitation with that first supplement. Um, and then also looking at those Medicare brackets as well. You know, if your income goes a certain goes above the certain modified adjusted gross income, then if Medicare applies to you, Part B premiums, those could go up as well if you're working part-time. So just something to be mindful there. But uh, I want to give you a very uh, detailed answer there, Charles. Thanks, Christian. Another question in from Beth. Regarding Social Security, she says, should I wait until age 67 years old to collect Social Security? This is another great question. And the answer is, again, it depends, right? Everyone is a little different. But on these depends questions, we like to give you some consideration, some things to think about when making this decision. The first big one for me is cash flow. You know, we say cash flow is the heartbeat of retirement. Cash is king. If cash flow is out of whack, then nothing else really falls into place. The first thing is cash flow. Do you need the income? If the answer is no, it might be worth waiting. You know, Social Security grows at a guaranteed 6% from age 62 to full retirement age. And then from full retirement age until age 70, it grows at a guaranteed 8%. That's pretty good. I'm not aware of anywhere else in the market where you can get a guaranteed 8% growth. So again, kind of going back to cash flow, do you need the income? Some other considerations are taxes. Social Security is up to 85% taxable as ordinary income. So how is that extra income going to affect your overall tax situation? Another thing to consider is survivor benefits. Whenever you lock in your Social Security benefit, should you pass away? And if you have survivors, that's the benefit that your survivors are going to receive. So if we lock in a low benefit, maybe at age 62 with some reductions in there, that's the amount that will be potentially passed to your survivor. And is that enough income for them? There's a few ideas, some things to consider in making this decision of when to draw Social Security. Yeah. Yeah. I love that when we're talking about if it can work out cash flow wise with our clients, we're always kind of on that side, that mindset that delaying it is going to be the best option because of that guaranteed growth. But also with those survivor benefits, like you mentioned, I'm, I'm, I'm really a big fan of you know, waiting till full retirement age, even later, maybe even to 70. Good news though, is it's not a decision that you have to make right now. It's a decision that you can make every single year to say, should I turn this on now or not? Um, another social security related question comes from Elaine. Elaine says, my spouse wants to collect his social security, but we're worried about taxes for payback. He is a year over full retirement and still working full time. We both work, so we're nervous of the taxes we might have to pay back. Any feedback on collecting and working after FRA, full retirement age? So Elaine, really good question here. And the good news is when it comes to collecting Social Security after your full retirement age, you no longer have that payback consideration or that concern. Once you've reached your full retirement age, there's no longer that earnings limitation that somewhere around $22,000. I have to double check the number for 2024, but somewhere around $22,000. If you earn above that number, that for every $2 you earn of Social Security, $1 would get reduced. That's only applicable up until your full retirement age. Once you're full retirement age, then that no longer applies. The only taxes would be just the normal taxes to consider here, which as you probably already know, up to 85% of your social security is taxable. 
What does that look like? Let's just say for an example here that we had $1,000 of social security benefits. And let's say that we're in that bracket where we're getting up to 85% as taxable. That just says that $1,000 a month that you're receiving from social security, that 850 would be subject to taxes. And that's going to run through the marginal brackets, you know, 10, 12, 22, uh, 24%, so on. Yeah, that's a great distinction, Christian, that it's 85% taxable, not taxed at 85%, right? Right, 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 so, right. You know, 15% is potentially tax-free. Another Social Security-related question. Social Security seems to be a hot topic right now. Donna writes in saying, hello, inquiring about what happens to my Social Security benefit if I expire. Can my husband receive it? So kind of going back to that survivor benefit, there may be situations where a spouse may not qualify uh, to receive a survivor benefit. If there's you know windfall elimination provisions, government pension offsets, th things like that. Uh, but generally, uh, if both spouses are receiving Social Security, then and one spouse were to pass away, the surviving spouse would claim the larger of the two benefits. So Donna, just as an example, let's say that you and your spouse are both receiving Social Security and your benefit is higher than your spouse's. Should you pass away, your spouse would inherit your Social Security benefit and forego their own. So there's only one Social Security benefit coming in at that point, and it's the higher of the two. Very good. The last question that we have came in, we're going to answer, it comes from Gina. Gina says, what is the average time between retirement date and your first full pension paycheck? I think that's a good distinction there that it's the first full pension paycheck. Because when you retire, typically within 45 days, within about 45 days is when you would receive your first interim check. And that interim check um, pays you typically somewhere between 60 to 80% of what you would be paid once your pension is finalized. And in that case, you know, that, that's helpful. But if we look at OPM's website, it's, it's saying around 60 to 90 days is the average time it's taking to process retirement. So you might get an interim check maybe once or twice, and then you would receive that full pension check once that gets finalized within around 90 days. Now, good planning rule here is when it comes to retiring, what we're always sharing with our clients is I like to plan for six months. And the reason why is, you know, what if it takes longer and we're only planning it's three months, but we don't have the cash flow to support if it's longer. That's something that we really need to make sure we have a good plan is that that cash flow plan, making sure we have that, you know, at least six months of emergencies there that we can pull from in case that pension runs a little bit longer. And good news, if it happens to be they process it sooner, that's just even better. But I like to plan for six months there. You know, sometimes that can be longer for more complex situations. Well, what are what are those complex situations? Well, it would be more of a colored, colorful work history. We're switching from one agency to the other. Maybe there's some part time there. Maybe there's some leave without pay, right? Um, we've seen a, a personal case with the client where they had a, a court order. Um, you know, they, they they had a divorce decree, and that really made things quite a bit longer. And so, those are things to be thinking about as well. But if you have kind of a more of a, a a normal work history, then plan for that six months. But it could probably be a little bit sooner. Would be what I would say. So, those were the questions that we wanted to answer today. Thank you, JT, for for running through those. This podcast is all about action items. And so we want to leave you guys with something to be thinking about, some things, some things to be doing. The first action item I would say for listeners would be go run that social security estimate. We, we're getting lots of questions on social security. So it would be a good time if you haven't done so, at least for this 2024 year, to run what those new social security estimates are. It'd be interesting to see what they are get that little COLA adjustment there too, which is nice. Go to that ssa.gov website, making sure we're seeing what those up-to-date social security estimates are. JT, what would be another action item for our listeners? Yeah, again, a lot of questions around cash flow. You know, a lot of these questions, my answer was, it depends. A lot of them go back to cash flow. We say cash flow is the heartbeat of retirement. I think you know, this is something that we ask our clients every meeting, even if it's 
you know, every month we'll ask our clients, we'll start the meetings with this question. How's your cash flow? This is mm-hmm. worth looking at going back and seeing how, what, how is your monthly spending? How much money do you have coming in? How much are you spending each month? And then use that monthly spending amount as a retirement income goal and seeing where that income is going to come in retirement. Going through that exercise can help answer a lot of these questions like when should I draw Social Security? How much do I need to draw from the TSP? How much income do I need in retirement? Yeah, very good. Well, JT, this was a lot of fun. Thanks for going through these questions and and answering them with me. Until next time, happy planning. 